All right, this morning I want to preach a sermon. Um, it's called Forbearance versus Forgiveness. Forbearance versus Forgiveness. Because, you know, people have misconceptions about what forgiveness is and how it works, and they often confuse it uh, with forbearance. And if you, if you wanted a sort of a, a perfect example of how, um, you know, the culture views uh, what Christians should be like, uh, think of Ned Flanders from uh, The Simpsons, right? It's, he's like this walkover and he never wants to confront anyone. And, and this is obviously a false picture of uh, what Christians should be like. So for some reason, uh, people get this idea about Christianity that it's like unspiritual to stand up for yourself uh, or it's unspiritual to seek justice. Uh, or it's unspiritual to confront somebody, right? Or it's unspiritual to, to make a big deal about things. You know, a lot of Christians, oh, you know, don't. And, you know, there's, there's obviously some truth to these things, things because with every misconception, there's always some truth to it. Because why? Because we have that area of convictions by the conscience, right? Like the question is, is it, is it something that you should make a big deal about or confront somebody about? Or, or is it worth seeking restitution over? So this sermon is going to address like the difference between uh, these two concepts and um, a couple of, I think, of misunderstood passages that are often used to, uh, I think, misteach these things. And I think if you understand the difference between these two things, then it'll help you make a wiser decision on uh, how you go about uh, different things. All right, so the first one we want to talk about is forbearance. What is forbearance? Now, obviously, forbear is to restrain from something, but, you know, forbearance, when it, when it talks about being patient with people, it's like restraining yourself from, you know, confronting somebody or, you know, putting up with, uh, you know, sort of wrongdoing. So it is related to being uh, sort of long-suffering, where you may be suffering something, you suffer long, and part of that is you're forbearing from reacting to it, right? So that's why these two things kind of go hand in hand. But obviously you can forbear from other things too. Like if you, if you, you need to go to the shops and you're being lazy or something, you can, you're forbearing from doing that. So the word itself means that, but we're talking about it in the sense of relationships and conflict management. So it's like to refrain from acting, you know, being patient with someone. Uh, you want to be careful with that word in the King James Bible because patience normally means to like endure through hard times, you know, like the patience of the saints when it talks about the tribulation and whatnot. So patience in the King James Bible is a little different to how we would think of patience where we're just, you know, waiting, you know. Um, but when we talk about being patient with somebody, it's a bit like long-suffering them. That's where we're talking about with forbearance. Now, in Ephesians 4, we see uh, that concept here where it talks about, you know, living in unity. And we see both the concepts of uh, forgiveness and forbearance. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So you see there the two concepts of you know, long suffering and forbearing one another in order that the church might walk in unity. And peace, because it requires these concepts, doesn't it? In order to have peace, because you know, when you get a bunch of sinners together, there's always going to be conflict. So this is why conflict management is always uh, very important. You understand how God would want you to go about you know, conflict management. Colossians 3, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, look at this, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So we see a few different concepts in there about you know, encouraging people to, to live at peace and in unity within the church, being, being merciful, kind, humble, you know, as opposed to proud. You know, only by pride, the Bible says, cometh contention. Humbleness of mind, meekness, right? long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. So what I'm talking about today is those, those things are actually two different things. Um, they're not the same thing, and um, we'll go about that a bit later on. Uh, but, and above all these, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So forbearance is when you restrain from trying to make things right. You're just basically putting up with it, right? You're long-suffering, you're forbearing, uh, with something that may be done wrong to you. So you can see that the situation hasn't been made right when you're forbearing, right? So the situation hasn't been done right. You obviously can have the choice whether to go about 
trying to make it right, and you can decide, is it, is it worth it to go about making it right? But you know, it doesn't mean the situation has been made right, you're just you know, putting up with it. That's basically what forbearance is. And, and that's part of it, because if the other party doesn't want to make up for it, if they don't want to make it right, you may have no choice but to forbear, right? And, you know, but we have, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a balance here. This is why it's, it's, it comes down to what, what your convictions are, because too much forbearance can be an unhealthy thing too, right? Because that's this idea of just bottling up things. And if you remember, I don't know if you guys did watch Simpsons, but if you remember that episode where Ned Flanders did bottle up and eventually he just snapped, didn't he? So this is why, this is not how God intends Christians to be, because if people just forbear, 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 thinking that they're just being spiritual, that that's your only option, and you never go about actually resolving the conflict when you're able to do so, you may just end up snapping, right? Because that, that, that uh, bottling up can lead to what the Bible talks about, like a root of bitterness, like bitterness can build up, and that's not healthy either. So that's why there's these two things that we have to balance where, hey, can I forbear is that my only option obviously the ideal option to, is to try and resolve the conflict but if that's not an option you must forbear but if you forbear you have to be wary of the dangers of bitterness right so in hebrews 12 look what it says here follow peace with all men see so that's that's the the goal right so the goal is never to just oh because you know, some people think that's how they go with peace it's just oh, i just want to be at peace so they they just never want to deal with any conflict. But th that's not actually being spiritual, right? Because spiritual is you actually seek to resolve the conflict, but it's in the event you can't, then you have no choice to forbear. But, you know, but if, you're, if forbearing is just your, always your go-to whenever there's a conflict, generally, sometimes people just use that as, as an excuse because they never want to confront somebody. They never want to actually, you know, make right the situation. And that's not the right thing either. So you follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. See, when we harbor bitterness, you know, thoughts of hate and revenge and, you know, people get very bitter, generally they're hurting themselves the most, right? You know, because you're not hurting the other person by having bitterness in you. you the, the root of bitterness springs up, troubles you, and thereby many be defiled. So the, it's like the bitterness that comes up in you, it will actually spread to others too. This is why it's, it's very dangerous to have this root of bitterness. You're not actually, you know, the other person that you're bitter against may not even be aware that you're bitter. So it's like to harbor these thoughts and thinking that it's somehow hurting them, it, it doesn't. This only really hurts the person and the people around that person who is, who is bitter. So we need to be aware of that. All right, so see, so that's forbearance, right? So how do we go about conflict resolution before we get into forgiveness? Uh, let's talk about conflict resolution. Now, conflict resolution, like seeking a resolution, it really is the responsibility of both parties, right? So it's interesting in the Bible that we have both angles of, of conflict resolution, even though in Matthew 18, we're given like sort of a, a structure about how to go about it. But in Matthew 5, look at what it says here. Verse 23, it says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So you see how God, I mean, it's this, it's this sort of same uh, principle in, in, in Samuel's day when Saul gave the offering, and he gave the offering of the sheep and the goats that, that he was meant to destroy. Um, and Samuel told him, what? It is better to obey than to sacrifice, right? So what is this principle here? Is that God would rather you be obedient than you giving something to him whilst you're being disobedient. So here's the same principle that if, if you know you have a conflict with somebody, like somebody has ought against you, right? Before you, you want know, to just give things to God, he's saying he would rather you go and get right with that person before you give your offerings and sacrifices to God. But notice here that you, you remember us that thy brother hath fought against thee. So you see how you're aware there that somebody has a problem with you, right? So, and, and we're talking about thy brother hath fought against thee. So generally the principle is that 
you know, it's a, it's a you know, Christian brother, it's a believer, right? Because if it's an unbeliever, sometimes unbelievers have a problem with you just for doing what's right. So we're, we're not talking about people that have a problem when you're trying to do what's right. It's, it's when you've wronged somebody, right? You've actually wronged, you've truly wronged them. They have a problem with you. It's saying God's encouraging us here, you know, right your wrong before you come and give something to me, right? So the idea here is, you, here is interesting that you know that you've wronged somebody and they have ought against thee. Now we go to Matthew 18, where that's the sort of the famous passage that we know where it talks about um, how the escalation process is in actually dealing with a conflict. And it says here, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. So it's the other way around now. So in the first one, it was you've done something wrong because your brother has ought against you. This one is they've done something wrong to you, right? Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now, now why is this important? Because some Christians have this idea that it's only the responsibility of the person that's done the wrong in order to try and resolve the conflict. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible actually gives both angles that if you've done the wrong and you know, yes, you have a responsibility to God to go and right the wrong. But also, if you know, right, that somebody else has done wrong against you and that's like, you know, troubling you, because tru they may not know the situation, then you have a responsibility to go and try and, um, you know, resolve that conflict as well. And obviously, we don't throw principles of, love and mercy and harmony and all that respect out the window when we try and do this, but it's saying that there is a responsibility there too. So moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Very important um, word there in the first verse. Go and tell him between thee, this is you singular, right? And him singular alone because what often happens you know, when people have conflict they tell everyone but the person that has wronged them right so this is just how the flesh works but uh, you know we, we were to go with the way God wants us to deal with things we go and tell the person uh, between thee and him alone if he will not hear thee verse 16 then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established and if he neglect to hear them Tell it unto the church. But if you neglect to hear the church, there, let him uh, be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So we see that escalation process that God has built in that should go through believers first. And we, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later when we go to 1 Corinthians 6. But, you know, it's, it's there because, you know, sometimes the right thing to do is, is not necessarily, um, you know, uh, what do you say, like legal, you know, or the legal thing to do is not necessarily the right thing to do. Uh, just meaning that there's sometimes a conflict between what the government is implementing and what should be right to do. And there's a lot of laws like that, you know, laws around, um, you know, even, um, you know, relationship management and, you know, with children and things like that. So sometimes you have to be careful when, when you go to the authorities because you don't want to start a ball rolling in something that shouldn't be done by the authorities. But obviously we shouldn't be worried about going to the authorities when it's something the government should handle, right? Um, and that's why I think God has this process here where it goes through the church and then, you know, people within the church and the wise people within the church can decide what's the best way to handle this if it requires going to an outside source of authority. Um, and, and churches have got into trouble with this sort of stuff, right? Because they, they, they try and deal with it internally and it should have gone to the criminal, <laughs> you know, like especially when things like molestation and all that sort of stuff where they hit it within the church and it shouldn't have been dealt like that. It, it should have, it is actually something the government should deal with um, but yeah, um, I won't go into too much of that, but you, you get my point. So, um, if the right thing to do in the Christian life is to just always just put up with it, you know, like some people think as a Christian should be, like Christian is just a walkover and oh, I'm just forbid, you know, but then they think, oh, it's because I'm a forgiving person. I'm just forgiving, forgiving everyone. They're wrong. That's not actually forgiveness, right? That's forbearance. Now, if, if that was the case, if that's how God expected a Christian to behave, why, is, why does this process exist, right? I mean, obviously the process exists because if you have a conflict, you have a trouble, there's pr principles about how you go about 
resolving those issues, whether or not you're the one that did the wrong or whether or not you've been wronged, right? Now, a couple of things to note in this passage is, you know, the two or three witnesses, when they go and talk to the person, they're present. Because I've often seen this verse used where somebody thinks that if they've just heard about a conflict from two or three people, then that's the two or three witnesses. That's not the case here. This is the, the two or three witnesses are accusing somebody of something or saying something that happened, but the, the one accused is actually present too. So you can notice here that there's a conversation between multiple people here. It's not just you've heard it from a few people and therefore it's true, right? When the Bible talks about the mouth of two or three witnesses, it's the mouth of two or three witnesses with the person that is present to be able to answer for himself, right? There's that principle there of being able to, to speak for yourself. And you say, well, what if somebody's done something wrong, yet they're not in your church? Well, you know, you can obviously try to escalate through their own church. And if not, then, you know, you, you, if you cannot go through this process with this person, um, that's where the Bible, you know, gives that final sort of thing. Well, you can treat them as they're, they're an unbeliever, right? You don't need to go through the church system anymore. So um, that's where you can see that kind of escalation. So you go to them with some multiple people, they won't hear you. And you have to bring it up with the leaders within a church. And then if that doesn't work, then you, you may have to seek the resolution you know, outside of that system, you know, whether it's through an employer, through the courts or whatnot, or to even with the police. You know? All right, so let's talk about what forgiveness is. So forgiveness, let's look at uh, Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, 12, it says here, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So when we think about God forgiving us of our sins, forgiving us of our sins, like he forbears with us too, right? Like he puts up with us. But when he forgives our sins, he is merciful to us in terms of the wrongs that we've done. But he says, he's, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, if we were to think about the perfect standard of forgiveness, that would be the perfect standard, right? The perfect standard would be that, that it's as if they never did it, right? It's like justified. You know, they say justified means just as if I'd never sinned. You ever heard that? So that's the idea of forgiveness is, is that when you forgive somebody, it's not just you accept their apology, but you just keep it in the back for one day to bring it up again. If you've truly forgiven somebody, it means that it's as if they've never, never, never did it. You, now, that's obviously very, very difficult to do. I mean, you know, I'm sure there are times in your life where somebody's wronged you and you, you don't even remember that they did it. You know, so it's not impossible. But that's the standard, right? That's how God would forgive. That's what we're talking about when we talk about forgiveness. So you can see the difference between forbearance where it hasn't been resolved, right? You know, you may forget about it, but... If you don't forget about it, you're not necessarily wronged because you're wrong because you know it may be something that still needs to be dealt with. But forgiveness is if you've forgiven somebody, right? It sh it shouldn't come up again, right? Because you've truly forgiven them, then it should be like this principle. Now, what's what's a key difference between forbearance and forgiveness? Forgiveness requires an admission and an apology, a request, right, on from the offending party, right? So when you say somebody wrongs me and it's just, ah, oh, it's, 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 it's all right, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it, and you say, oh, I'm forgiving them, are you forgiving them? You're not actually forgiving them. You're just forbearing it, right? Because forgiveness has to be somebody actually asks for forgiveness and then you're able to offer the forgiveness that they are requesting. Right? Now, if you just forget about it, you know, that would just be like you're forbearing it and you just it didn't make a big deal and to the point where you even forgot about it. But that's not technically forgiveness, right? Forgiveness is, it always require, it, it requires somebody to ask for forgiveness and then it's offered to them. Let me show you some verses on forgiveness and we just see this very clearly uh, when we talk about forgiveness. 1 John 1, this is with God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you see that if we confess our sins, right? Because why? He will, he can, he will put up with our sins. 
if and, and if we believe on Jesus Christ, obviously that's that's where we all our sins in terms of eternal punishment have been forgiven. But in terms of our relationship with God as well, you know, until we come to God and confess them, God is not able to forgive us of those sins until we, you know, um, actually confess them too. Otherwise, he's just forbearing with us. This is why Psalm 86 verse 5 says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. And he's ready to forgive because he's ready for us to come to him to ask for forgiveness. He wants to forgive. And that's the sort of mentality we should have when people have wronged us. So we want to forgive them and we want to, to make it right. But, you know, unless they are willing to admit they're wrong and you're not able to forgive them. And plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Look what Jesus says in Luke 17. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he rep repent, forgive him. So you see there where somebody's wronged you, you might confront them and say, hey, you know, well, this, I think this was not right to do. Um, forgiveness is given when it's asked. If he repent, right? He changes his mind. He's, he's asking for forgiveness. Forgive him. So what is the Bible teaching us here? It's saying that, it, it, we're talking about the difference between forbearance and forgiveness, but what it's saying here that if somebody does ask for forgiveness, if somebody does repent and say, please forgive me, the Bible's saying here, you must forgive them, right? So you can't have somebody forgiving you, you go, I'm not forgiving you for that, because now you're in the sin, right? So you weren't in sin saying, hey, there's something wrong and it's unresolved, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to let it make me bitter or whatnot, but it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm justified in feeling wronged in this situation. But if that person goes, I'm sorry, I did wrong, please forgive me, and you still harbor those feelings, then, then you're actually in the wrong now, right? Because you should actually be forgiving people when they ask for forgiveness. And then we know that he says here, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Right? So we go to Matthew 18, right? Where this idea of seven times in a day. And, you know, the, the point that Jesus was making is that there's no limit, right? He's used the number seven. But then Peter sort of takes it literally in Matthew 18 and says, how many times do I have? What's the limit of how many times I need to forgive my brother? Till seven times? So he's saying like, so, so if he wrongs me the eighth time in the day, I don't need to forgive him anymore? That's basically what he's saying here. So, you know, but Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee, until seven times, but until 70 times seven. So he's just saying there is no limit. So as much as he keeps coming back and asking forgiveness, you should be forgiving him, even if it's, you know, 490 times in a day. Verse 23, therefore, so this whole principle of forgiveness, then we have this, the parable, right, of the unforgiving servant. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. So you see how he's, he's requesting here, right? He didn't just, in this instance, he didn't just forgive, well, in this instance, he didn't just forgive the debt without him actually requesting, like, hey, please, um, Help, uh, help me, have patience with me. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. So you see there that idea that he came to him. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So a couple of important things here. Here's, this is a parable to describe, you know, God's how God operates, right? Where he's saying, like, look, you know, 
you, you should not be forgiven. Well, you're not going to be forgiven if you don't be a forgiving person yourself. Now, what you don't want to misunderstand here is that obviously Jesus here is preaching under the Old Testament, right? And he's teaching here, like, like he did many times, you know, this idea of, you know, this work salvation that people could not keep. So just like he talked about, you know, things that could send you to hell, you need to remember that, yes, you know, if being unforgiving would send you to hell, right? But then because we have Jesus Christ, we have that grace, right? So you need to understand that when you see a passage like this taught by Jesus, people will say, well, isn't Jesus teaching like a work salvation here, right? Well, he did. He did teach them how the old covenant worked. Because remember, they were trying to justify themselves in the eyes of the old covenant. So he was often saying things like this to them to show them that they were not keeping that old covenant. But this doesn't obviously negate the fact that there is this new covenant, that Jesus has died for all our sins and whatnot. So you just need to be careful when understanding passages like this and understand that, you know, Jesus, he taught about the Sabbath, right? He taught about these things that no longer apply. He taught about um, these things. Why? Because when he was walking on this earth, he was still living in Old Testament times, right? So he was teaching them about the Old Testament. But the reason why he would teach these things is not because it was possible to be saved by the Old Testament. He was showing them that they had not kept it, right? So just keep those things in mind when you read things like this. All right, last section I want to talk about is misused passages. Misused passages. <coughs> where people get this idea of, you know, Christians shouldn't confront, Christians shouldn't make a big deal about things, Christians shouldn't try and seek resolutions, Christians shouldn't stand up for themselves, right? Because often you think like, you know, if you're, if you're being walked on over, walked all over, you know, at work or in some social setting, right? And is it wrong for you to speak up and, you know, uh, take a stand for yourself, right? And obviously it's not. So, but you have to be wise about when you do it. You know, no question there about what's the wisest thing to do. That's the difficult thing, right? Knowing the principles is the easy thing. When and what situation to apply it, that's what requires wisdom and everyone has to sort of decide for themselves based on the situations they're in. But the key point I'm trying to drive home today is don't think it's a spiritual thing just to be a doormat, right? It, it, that, that is not... Um, you know, a spiritual thing where you're just doing it because you don't, you think avoiding conflict for any reason is something spiritual, right? There may be some wisdom in delaying a resolution or just forbearing, you know, but this is where it does require that wisdom on how to best resolve it. But some misused passages. Let's just first go to 1 Corinthians 6. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Right? So what is this talking about? This is talking about believers suing one another in court. Right? When you have a conflict, maybe it's a payment dispute or financial thing or anything else, slanderous thing, you know, and just taking somebody to court frivolously, right? kind of like in the United States. You know, they just make a joke of it almost where they have those reality TV shows and it's just like, is this a, it's like a mockery of the court system that you, you make it like a reality. It's for entertainment purposes. It's never for entertainment purposes. It's for justice, right? So it's saying, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much, how much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? So this is the verse, verse 7, that's normally taken out of context, right? So you can see why, how, you can see how that verse could be used to just go, why don't you just suffer yourself to be defrauded? <laughs> just, just take it, you know, just be a doormat, right? 
Why not just rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Why don't you rather take wrong? But what is the context, right? The context here is if, if somebody takes, you know, you don't go take somebody to court, right, and not go through the, 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 the escalations that God has set in place to make sure you get righteous judgment. He says, you know, do rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded, do, the, do it the right way rather than go about it the wrong way and go before the unbelievers and the unjust. Nay, you do wrong and defraud and that your brethren. Right? So you're not going about it the right way. You're actually, you could be putting them at risk as you go before um, the unjust courts. So what is this passage talking about here? Is this passage teaching that you can never take somebody to court? That there's never a situation where you should sue somebody? No. All it's saying is, you know, you, you shouldn't go there first. Like in Matthew you know, 18, right? There's that escalation. So you try and deal with it with them first, right? And then you try and, you know, have multiple people go through the church. Now, if they don't hear all those things and it's like some financial dispute, is it then wrong to say, well, I need, you're not going to listen to the authority, the spiritual authorities in our life. So now I have to go to the unbelieving world to get judgment on this thing. And through that process, it might have been counseled like, hey, that, I think that's the right thing to do. So there's, it's, this is a justifiable reason for why you should take them to law. So this is not a passage talking about you never go, right? It's just saying it's better to go through the church first to determine whether it is something that should be going. And if you continue to read 1 Corinthians 6, it talks about like, no, you're not the unrighteous shall inherit the earth. And, and why, is it, why is that context? Because it's saying, why are you going to the ungodly, unbelieving world to get righteous judgment, you know, when they might be giving a wrong judgment, right? So this is, this is what he's condemning here. Not that it's, it's never right to take a Christian to court if you need to, right? So not only that, the talking about the suffering yourself to be defrauded, it's saying, yeah, you don't take somebody to court, like, you know, just suffer yourself to be defrauded and go about it the right way, right? Don't just go about it in the wrong way. And um, you can even see it in the context of this passage where he's saying, don't go before the courts. He's saying, you'd be better off putting the least esteemed in the church to judge amongst your brothers. He's saying, don't you even have somebody wise amongst your group that can judge between two people? So you see the context there. He's like, don't go to the unbeliever. Don't you even have like the least esteemed in the church? Probably better than the unbelieving judge that doesn't know the Bible and doesn't care about the things of God. So that is what 1 Corinthians 6 is talking about. So you can attempt to settle things with them. If they're not willing, you can take action. Um, and it's just saying that the unjust judicial system is not the first point of contact. And we already talked about Matthew 18. Um, and why is that? Because some things that are illegal shouldn't be, right? And vice versa. So this is why um, it's good to judge using God's, words for, God's word first before figuring out what might happen if you go to court. And obviously the costs and all that associated there. Now what's the other one? And uh, sort of end on um, this topic. Matthew 5. You've heard that it had been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. For whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. I would say this is probably, you know, um, when you think about the, the passages that people would use for Christians to just be a walkover and a doormat, I'd say it's this one, right? Turn the other cheek, turn the other cheek. Now, this is not what this passage is teaching, right? This passage is not teaching that, like, if somebody punches you, right, you shouldn't do something about it, right? Don't defend yourself. Don't, but what, it, what it's talking about is, see, this law in the Old Testament, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and we'll look at that, People were using this to justify taking revenge into their own hands, right? That's what they were doing, right? But this is not to say that if somebody assaults you and beats you up, that you can not then seek restitution for a court to like order them to like, you know, pay fines or whatever in order to make sure that you're healed up, right? It's like, that's, like, that's why we have a court system that has charges for assault, right? Because if you get punched and you can't work, you sue somebody for that assault, and then they need to pay for your lost time. You see? So that's a, that's a very different thing. So this is not saying if somebody assaults you, don't do anything about it. This is saying if somebody assaults you, 
this law is not justifying you going and burning their house down or something, you know what I mean? Like you going and take, taking the law into your own hands, right? So there's a very difference because, you know, sometimes Christians will talk about things that should be illegal, you know? Like we obviously think things should be illegal. The government should deal with it this way. And then they'll say like, yeah, but just turn the other cheek. You know, it's like say somebody gets murdered and you're like, you know what? The government should be, you know, cracking down on like, you know, abortion or cracking down on these things. And we make those stances and then people will say things like, oh, so you think we should just go out and just, just kill them? It's like, no, 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 I'm not saying that we take the law into our own hands. We're promoting that the government should do what the government is appointed to do by God and to, to seek justice. Now, often I've heard this passage of turn the other cheek that it's, it's like rebuking Christians who are trying to seek justice. Like if their family's been wronged, right? Let's say like, you know, your kid was like molested by some Catholic priest and you want justice. You know, are you doing something evil? No, you're seeking justice. Now, if you go to the Catholic priest's home and, you know, go and beat him up, that is where you are doing wrong, right? So this is where, like I said, people were using this law to justify that, but you need to understand the difference. And this is why when it says you turn the other cheek, it means you don't fight back, you go about it the lawful way, right? And this is why it goes through, if any man will sue thee at the law and take the, so you respect the court process, right? So you see how it kind of plays into to that. You smite, if you smite, you turn the other cheek, but it also talks, it talks about if a man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Now what's interesting, I want to show you um, these passages in the Old Testament, this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and you'll, you'll see this idea that I'm, that I'm talking about. Leviticus 24, 19. If a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Right. So remember, these are, these are laws that are in place. Right. So this is like, it gets brought to the judges. The judges decide, okay, you did this to somebody, it's going to be done to you. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. If he has caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. So you can see here that there is this case of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. This is the scales of justice. But what were they getting wrong? They're using these laws of most to take matters into their own hands, right? Not this is how the court decides what's going to happen with somebody. Now, what is this instance here? This instance here is, is like, it's like a, I don't know what they call it in court. It's like, it's like unaggravated. It'd be like if, it's like, it, like for example, right? It's like the, you know, those idiot little, those idiot teenagers that were playing that king hit game. What do they call it? Are they just like, you know, they were just like unsuspecting person just walking down the road and they could see where they could knock them out in one punch. You know, they, you know <laughs> you're shocked. You haven't heard about that? It was like this game that they were playing. It's absolutely evil to the core. But it's like the, these teenagers trying to take videos of themselves to see if they could just punch some unsuspecting victim. And the game was like, see if you can knock them out with one hit. And they just like king hit them and then just, just run away and like laugh. And like, who knows what happened to that person? So this is where this law comes into play, right? Where it's like, okay, you cause some blemish in somebody, it's completely unaggravated. You know what? The justice is, that's going to be done to you. So it's like, even if like, you, you were to hurt, lose somebody's eye, this is where it got to the point where you cause somebody's eye to perish, now your eye is going to perish, right? That's the idea, is to stop people from doing things unaggravated, right? So there, this is this idea, but it's a court process, isn't it? It's not just taking the law into your own hands. It's not that you get beat up, so then you go with a bunch of mates and then go beat that person up. But look at this, this is what's interesting. Here's, a, here's the difference. Look at this in Exodus 21. It says here in verse 18, If men strive together, and one smite another with a stone or with his fist, and he die not, but keepeth his bed. If he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and cause him to be thoroughly healed. So this is this idea of, you know, if you get into a fight. Now, what's the difference between this one and the one in Leviticus? This one is two people go at it, right? So this is not like you just done something to somebody unprovoked, un, uh, un, un right? This is like, you can imagine like two guys in a bar, right? You, know, you look at me, right? And then one guy gets beat up. So you can see that it's, well, you strove together, but you know, you did beat him up. You still can be sued to get the loss of time and to be healed, right? You know, but the, the punishment seems to be worse, uh, seems to be less because it was provoked. So you can see that there's, even in the Bible, you can see the difference between unprovoked and provoked. And one is, you know, it'll just be done to you. The other is, 
or you just need to pay for the loss of time. So that's the first instance of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It's this idea of balance in the law, fairness, justice. Exodus 21, verse 22. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So what's here? Men fight, woman who's pregnant gets involved, so obviously this is like case law, right? It's like a situation. So judges can obviously use things like this to determine other judgments. What's happening here? So woman gets involved in the loses her child, right? We'll talk about what this passage here means, yet no mischief follow in the next verse. But basically he's saying here, if that happens, then there's restitution to be made. He will lay upon, uh, shall, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judges determine. So notice here that if there's a tussle, there's somebody loses a baby even, there's payment, there's restitution, financial restitution to make up for the loss that you've occurred because it was a, a fight, right? It wasn't like Leviticus 24 where you've just unprovoked, you know, a woman. Uh, I don't know what would happen in that instance. Maybe that person would just be uh, put to death, you know, if you've, if you've, it's like murdering somebody's child. <clears throat> So what does it mean by mischief follow? Now this is what I believe, because the Bible doesn't describe it entirely. But I think mischief follow means if, if you get into a fight with somebody, your wife gets involved, you lose the baby, you realize you've lost the baby, right? And then it's like, you know what, I'm going to go get revenge, right? That's what I think the Bible's talking about when it says, if, if no mischief follow means nothing else was done after that. You went to the law, you will be compensated for your loss. Right, But if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So isn't that interesting? Even though you've been, you've been wrong, you know, you've gone into a fight, you've lost a child, but if you go and kill that person for a revenge, the judges will put you to death. Right? So it's, what is this discouraging? This is discouraging taking the law into your own hands. Right? Because if you go and take the law into your own hands, the just thing to do is that whatever you did, it will be done to you. Right? So there's a difference between taking the law into your own hands and obviously the courts doing it. And the last one we'll talk about, uh, last example, I'm going to see what a couple more verses. Deuteronomy 19. This one I really love. I mean, I, I think if we had something like this in our system, it would be great. Deuteronomy 19, 16. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him, that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days, and the, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil thing among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So what's the last scenario? The last scenario is if you're a false witness, right, in a, in, a, in a court case, and you were trying to condemn somebody. So it makes you think about when, the remember the false witnesses wanted Christ dead, what should have happened to them? They should have actually been put to death, right? If they were found as false witnesses. Because remember, they, they, remember they, they asked them, their stories didn't agree. So you see how, what does this do? This makes somebody think twice before they falsely accuse somebody in a court of law, right? What if a woman, you know, oh, I, was, I was raped, you know, I want him to be put in jail. And it found, turns out, okay, she just made the whole story up. What should happen in that instance? she should go to jail, right? For whatever period of time she wanted that guy to go to jail, right? So you can see here this eye for eye in the context of understanding Matthew 5, right? It, you can see it's about taking the law into your own hand. But it's not wrong to seek justice through the law. And this is the point I want to end on here, these two verses. So Romans 12. Romans 12. Now notice here, this is, I'm going to read to you the last few passages of Romans 12, and this goes into Romans 13, right? Well, we talked about last week. 
Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Right? So that's like taking the law into your own hands. That's, that's the evil. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Right? There's a place for it. Where is that place? Right? The way that God has ordained things with authorities. Right? Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. See, so it's not that you don't resist evil like people will use Matthew 5. It's there's a way to resist. It's like you don't take, resist evil, take it into your own hands. There's a right way to resist evil. You overcome evil with good. Now, that's the last verse of Romans 12. And then what does Romans 13 talk about? So you see the context is how do you go about righting the wrong? Well, there are authorities in place. Right? Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. So remember how in Romans 12 it says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Some people just think that is, well, you know, God will just deal with it supernaturally or somehow, right? No. One way God deals with it is he has a government there that you can seek justice from, right? Who then will carry out, you know, his justice. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnations. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou, not, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Look at this. For he, right, the authorities in power that have the authority to execute judgment and carry the sword of God, he is the minister of God to thee. Look at this. For good. Remember, overcome evil with good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath unto him that doeth evil. See, so hopefully it's interesting for you how it all ties together. So, in conclusion, what I want to dispel today, and hopefully made it clear, that this idea that the more Christian thing to do is simply just to suffer wrong and there's no avenue of restitution is absolutely false, right? This whole turn the other cheek doesn't mean you can't do anything about it. Turning the other cheek means you suffer the wrong, but you doesn't justify you doing something wrong, right? You go about it the right way. Um, not every situation is work, worth seeking restitution for. So that doesn't mean you have to make sure it's, you always get, you get right, because sometimes it may not be worth it. It may not be the wise thing to do. Um, but if someone suffers wrong, seeking restitution is not wrong, as long as it's done in a righteous way. And Christians ought not be a doormat. Don't be a walkover. When we seek justice, we need to make sure it's done in a godly way. All right, so hopefully you learned something here today. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, uh, we thank you that, uh, you know, you, you do expect us to have some boldness, Lord and help us to stand up for ourselves. But help us, Lord, have the wisdom to know when and how and the right way to do it. So we thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ, a perfect example for us uh, of boldness and grace. Pray, Lord, that you help us to be more like him each and every day. We pray in his name. Amen.